Hi scientists, I'm Ms. Alasky, eighth grade science teacher at Asa Mercer International Middle School. For those of you that are my students, I've missed you these last couple of weeks, and thanks for those of you that have been checking in with me on Schoology. For those of you that are not my students, I'm sure your teachers miss you as well. Today we're going to start our natural selection unit, one of my favorite units because we're looking at populations and how they change over time. So today we're going to start with lesson 1.2, the mystery of the poisonous newt. What you'll need for this lesson is something to write with and something to write on. Optional materials, if you have someone that you can check in with, maybe a family member in the house with you, or a friend or a relative that you can text or Snapchat. If you have a copy of the Rough Skin New article, that's great. If you have a computer, go ahead and log into Amplify. And for an activity near the end, if you have 12 small objects that can be sorted, um, it could be coins, could be building cubes, any small thing that has differences. We're going to start with a little warm up, get you thinking about our unit. So I want you to look at these frogs and then describe the group of frogs in the image. So you can write this down, you can talk with whoever you're checking in with, however you want to record. What do you notice? All right, now you've had a chance to get your ideas down. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I notice. So one thing that I notice is I know these are frogs based on the shape of their body and their legs, and they look a little bit shiny or slimy. Some things that I notice is all of these frogs have at least two different colors, but not all of their colors are the same. So I notice some of the ones at the top are kind of brown with some yellow or green. In the middle, they're more orange, some of them with brown, teal, or yellow spots. And then down through, through the bottom, there are some that are more reddish and they seem to have black or orange spots. A very important word for this unit is population. So population is a group of the same type of organism living in the same area. So we can talk about populations like the human population of Seattle or the human population in Washington state. And that's how many people live in those areas. We can also talk about populations of animals, like these seals that live in the Pacific Ocean. Or we can talk about populations of plants, like these cedar trees around Mount Rainier. The population that we're going to be talking about in this unit are the rough-skinned newts. So a wild biologist is a scientist who studies interactions of organisms with one another and their environment. As you watch this video, listen for why this group is interested in rough-skinned newts. <laughs> Sean? Over here! Finally! It's down here! Uh huh, and you're sure this time? Hurry up, take a picture before he gets away. What did I tell you? A poisonous nude! This doesn't prove anything. It doesn't even look poisonous. But I read about this guy that died from eating one, and this looks just like it. His friends dared him. That's horrible, but I doubt this is the same kind. Let's go back and ask those rangers if you don't believe me. All right. Race you. Seriously? Whoa. Is everything OK, guys? There aren't any poisonous newts in this park, are there? What? We just found one, and we took a picture. Show her. Mm. Yep, that's a rough skin newt, and they are poisonous. Well, poisonous to bugs, maybe, but he's trying to tell me that these are the type that can kill people. Is that true? Rough skin newts have dangerous poison all over their skin, and it is true, people have died from eating them. See, I told you, I read about a guy that ate a rough skin newt, and he was all dizzy and his body went fully numb, and he was dead in 20 minutes. Unfortunately, that really happened. We were just a couple feet away from one. We're lucky to be alive. Oh, you weren't in any real danger. Rough skin newts are very shy. Just don't bother them and they won't bother you. So, are you like a newt expert? Well, sort of. I'm a wildlife biologist here at the park and we're researching the rough skin newts. Why are they so poisonous? A lot of visitors have the same question, and so far we have some interesting clues. We know that the newt population has changed over time. There are more individuals with very high levels of poison now than there were in the past. These newts have gotten more poisonous over time? That's right. Hmm. I wonder how they got so poisonous. Excellent question. That's one of the things we're trying to find out. 
Actually, if you guys don't mind, could you show me where you found that, Newt? Yeah, sure. Why do you want to see the place? So I can mark it on our map and we can return there to make observations. Cool. So you heard in the video, Dr. Alex Young say that the newts have become more poisonous over time. So I want you to take a moment and think. You can write down, share your idea with whoever you're checking in with. What do you think caused the newt population to become more poisonous? Dr. Alex Young needs some help figuring out how the newts became more poisonous over time. She's been gathering some ideas and the two most common things that she hears are claim number one, that some newts became more poisonous because they wanted to. The newts do seem like smart creatures. Or claim number two, that something in the environment caused the newts to become more poisonous. Over the course of this unit, we'll gather some evidence and figure it out. As I said, one of the important words that we'll use in this unit a lot is population. We're going to look at a lot of different populations and an important thing is to be able to describe traits within a population. So what we have here is one butterfly. And so what I notice is the wings are broken into four parts. Um, on the left side, the wing is light yellow and peach, and then it has a brown dot on the top part of the wing. The right wing is much darker, so the bottom is a darker yellow, the top is a darker peach, um, and then there's that thick brown edge on the top right wing, and instead of having a brown dot, it has a blue dot. So what you're going to do is I'm going to give you two more butterflies, and with whoever you're talking with, whether you're checking in digitally with someone or there's someone in the room with you, I want you to discuss how can we describe a population by talking about these two butterflies. What did you notice about these butterflies? What similarities and what differences did you notice in this population? This leads us to our second important word of the unit, trait. Trait is a specific characteristic of an individual organism. So when we look at these butterflies and we look at their wing color, each individual has its trait. Some of them have solid pale yellow, some of them have a solid darker yellow, and some of them have yellow and brown. And those are the traits of the individuals in this population. If you have a copy of the article, The Rough Skin Newt, or are logged into Amplify, follow along as I read it to you. While we're reading, I want you to think about what are you learning about the newt population? Rough skinned newts may not appear dangerous. They are no longer than 20 centimeters, eight inches, with stubby legs and teeth that look like tiny bumps. However, some of these newts are the most poisonous animals in the Pacific Northwest. One rough skinned newt can have enough poison in its body to kill dozens of humans. That's crazy, an eight inch long newt? That means if I took a regular eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and I laid a newt across the short edge of it, it wouldn't even be that big. And it can kill dozens of people. Rough skinned newts have brown bumpy skin on their backs with bright orange skin on their bellies. When threatened by predators, newts curl their bodies to show the orange undersides of their necks and tails. The orange color warns predators to stay away and most predators do. The only predators that regularly eat rough skin newts are common garter snakes. I wonder what's special about garter snakes that allows them to eat poisonous newts. Newts hatch in the water, but they spend most of their lives on land, often hiding under fallen leaves or bark. At night, they hunt for insects, tiny fish, and other small prey. When they are ready to mate, rough skin newts return to the water where males and females swim together in pairs. The females lay poisonous eggs and attach them to underwater plants. I bet having poisonous eggs makes it so that the eggs are less likely to get eaten. Now that we've read the article, take a moment and record two things you learned about our newt population. We're moving on to Natural Selection 1.3, exploring variation and distribution in population. I'm going to introduce you to our digital model, the Natural Selection Simulation. The reason scientists use digital models, like the sim that we're about to use, is that it allows them to look at things that are too big or too small, or in our case, take a really long time. If we want to look at populations and how they change, it takes hundreds and thousands and millions of years for the population to change, but we can see changes in a very short amount of time in the sim. If you're able to log in, go ahead to 1.3 Activity 2 and launch the Natural Selection Simulation and follow along. We're going to explore the sim and get to see what tools it has. 
If you're trying this exploration at home, what I want you to consider is what do the different buttons do? What do you notice about what you can change? And are there any questions? If you're not able to log in, don't worry, I'll take you through the same. This is my cat Akimbo. He's decided to join us for the next little part while we explore the sim. There are four main things that you need to know about the sim. The first two are in the build mode. There are two different things that you can build. You can build abiotic and biotic. So abiotic factors are all the non-living parts of the sim. The temperature, the rainfall, and the surface color. The second thing to know in the build mode is that you can change the biotic factors. We have three organisms in our environment. We have thorn palms, Australopes and Carnivons. We'll look at all of them closer in a little bit. The thing to know though is they have different traits and we'll look at differences in those traits. The third piece to this in is the run mode. This is where you see what happens based on the environment that you've set up. And the final step is the analyze phase. So this is where you look at your populations and their different traits and you can see how they changed over time as well. Now that you've seen the tools in Sim, let's try it out. So I click on run and I can see our different organisms. So I've got Australopes are the little bird-like creatures, Carnathons are the big red meat eaters, and the thorn palms are the trees. So these organisms aren't real, but they're based on real organisms. The idea being that you have a plant that does photosynthesis, an organism that eats plants, and an organism that eats other animals. They need energy in order to survive, and they also reproduce. So we can use these organisms to look at changes over time. Now we're going to try some missions in the sim. Again, if you're logged in, go ahead, pause this video and try them on your own. But if you're not logged in, don't worry, I'll take you through the missions right now. Our first three missions are all about the thorn palms. So I'm going to turn off the Australopes and the Carnathon so that I can focus on our thorn palms. Okay, so my first mission with the thorn palms is to have all of them have medium thorns. So I look at their thorn size and I can see all of them have medium thorns. So then I look around at them and I can see these little spikes on them and the size thorns that they have. So the second mission is to have many different sizes of thorns. Okay, so I look down here and I see this little bar that says variation. If I move it over to low variation, now I can see that I have a few different thorn sizes. If I move it over to medium, then I have even more different thorn sizes. If I move it over to high, then I can see that I have all the different thorn sizes. So I look at this and now this one has thorn size 10, so I can see it's really spiky. Kind of reminds me of my cousin when I had a mohawk. Right, and here's another, this one is thorn size seven, thorn, another thorn size seven, right? And so I can see that we have a different size thorn. This one is a thorn size four, and I can see it has barely any spikes on it at all. Our third mission with the thorn palms is to have many short thorns, sh short thorn palms, a few that are medium and none that are tall. So I'm going to leave them with a lot of variety with their thorn size and I'm going to switch to height. So right now they're all the same height. If I want to have many that are short, a few that are medium and none that are tall, I'm going to bump up my variation a little bit to medium, but now it's kind of spread out and most of them are medium, but I want most of them to be short. So I'm going to drag this over and now you can see that more of them are now going to be short a few of them will be medium and none will be tall. So now I look at this one and it's a short little thorn palm. And so I can see this, these differences in the height of the thorn palms. Our next two missions are with the Australopes. So I'm going to get rid of the thorn palms and I'm going to bring our Australopes back. So our first one is to change the color of the Australopes. So I'm gonna to switch to the color and I can see right now I have no variation in the color and so they're all color number five. So I look at this and color number five looks like a green. So I want to have blue, green, and yellow. Okay, so if I move the variation up more, now I can see this one's yellow. So this is color number eight. Okay, so yellow is a higher number. Green still yellow is number five. So that's in the middle is green. Let's see if I can find some other colors. Oh, here's kind of a blue. So this is color number three. So what I figured out is the low numbers, these are blues. The middle numbers are greens and the high numbers are yellows. Then I want to make it so that one of my features of the Australopith has a lot of variation and one feature has no variation. So I'm going to try armor. So right now the armor has 
no variation. So I'm going to make it so it has a lot of variation. Okay. So when then when I look at the Australopes, I can see these little spikes on their back and how much armor it has. Oh, I can't really see the spikes on that one. Here we go. There's some, oh, uh, there's some big spikes on that one. So that is the armor nine, right? So it's got some big spikes on it. So I have lots of variation in the armor and then neck length. I have no variation. So all of their necks are the same length. Our last two missions are with the Carnathons. So I'm going to remove the Australopes and bring the Carnathons back. I'm going to zoom out a little bit until I oh, can find some Carnathons. There we go. Okay. And what I want to look at is having a lot of fur and some with medium fur. So I already figured this out with the Australopes that in order to get that, I want to move to medium variation. And this time, instead of moving the distribution to the left, like I did before, this time I'm going to move it to the right. And Sarah can see the Carnathons now have a bunch of fur on them. And some of them have a little bit less, right? So most of them have a lot of fur and a little, some of them have less fur. Okay. And our last challenge with the Carnathons is to have the maximum variation possible. So I'm going to go with poison resistance and I'm going to go with the maximum variation. And so they each have a different amount of poison level resistance. So this one's a level nine, which means that it can withstand a lot of poison. This one's eight. So it can also withstand a lot of poison. Let's see if we can find one poison resistance two, which means that it can't stand up to much of the Australope poison. Those are all the missions for today, but in future lessons, we'll look at the organisms interacting with each other and see how their populations change over time. As you watch the video, listen for why we use histograms and what it shows us about variation. Biologists use graphs called histograms to show variation in populations of organisms. Let's look at a population of Australopes to understand how histograms can show variation. If you look at the Australopes, you can see that although they are all from the same population, they are all different from each other. They have different traits. For example, the Australopes vary in color from yellow to green to blue, and they have different amounts of fur on their bodies. Their necks range from very short to very long. These are examples of variation in the Australope population. If the population is broken into groups according to a single feature, such as the length of their neck, and they line up according to the trait of how long their necks are, we can see how many individuals have short necks and how many have medium, long, and very long necks. The lines of organisms are like bars in a graph. The taller the bar in the graph, the more organisms that have that neck length. This type of graph is called a histogram. This is the same histogram represented in a different way. It shows the same variation in neck length within the Australope population. If the Australopes are grouped by a different feature, the shape of the histogram will change. Now the Australopes are lining up according to color. You could count how many Australopes are each color by looking at every individual Australope, one by one. But using the histogram is easier. One quick look shows that most of the Australopes in this population are blue, some are yellow, and a small amount are green. Histograms help biologists understand the variation of traits in a population. They are also useful for comparing two or more populations, or for investigating how populations change over time. Hopefully that video helped add to your understanding of three more important words, variation, distribution, and histogram. Variation is any difference in traits between individual organisms. You saw lots of variation of the Australopes, right? There are different colors, they have different neck lengths. All those things are differences in their traits. Distribution is the number of individuals with each trait in a population. 
So when we look at the distribution of our astrolabe's color, we can see most of them are blue, many of them are yellow, and very few of them are green. And our final important word for today, histogram. So a histogram is a graph that uses bars to show how characteristics or values are distributed within a group. It's much easier to look at changes in populations if you can visually represent what the population looked like before and what it looked like afterwards. We'll use histograms a lot to show variation in populations. Let's practice making some histograms. For this, you'll need a piece of paper with a grid on it. Um, I just used a piece of line paper and drew a grid on it and 12 small objects that you can sort. So you have coins or Legos or building cubes, something, anything will work as long as there is variation in your materials. Here are my materials that I have that I'm gonna to use to practice making histograms. You can see I grabbed 12 random coins and then I made a grid on a piece of paper. So whatever materials you have, works great okay so we're going to start by making a histogram that shows no variation so if i want to think about something that all of my materials have in common one of the things that they all have in common is they are metal okay so i would sort this into one column showing them that all of them are metal it is totally fine if your materials go off your paper if your histogram is not big enough especially when we're doing things where they are all one thing is totally fine. Then if I want to show low variation, I might do something like sort by color. So and then I sort them into columns based on what color they are. And you see I have super low variation because they are either silver or copper. Okay. Or if I want to increase my variation, I might sort them by their value. And so my pennies are all worth one cent. My nickels are worth five, my dimes are worth 10, and my quarters are worth 25. And so I can increase the amount of variation that I show based on the trait that I select. Keep using your materials, try making different histograms, showing different amounts of variation. We'll use histograms a lot as we look at what happens to our populations and how they change over time. We'll end today with our first key concept for natural selection. Make sure you record this. A population can be described by the traits present and by the number of individuals who have each trait. Again, a population can be described by the traits present and by the number of individuals who have each trait. You saw this today with our butterflies and the variety of traits that they had with their wing color. You saw this with our ostrilopes, right? They had different neck lengths, different colors, different fur amounts. You saw this with our thorn palms and our carnathons. So anytime you're looking at a population, you're looking at what traits they have, and how many have each of those traits. Thanks for joining me today as we started natural selection. I hope you'll join me next time when we look at what happens to ostrilopes when their environment changes. See you next time.